Now, if you don't know, those two are sisters. Amen. I think most of you know that, but it, uh, I've known them a long time. I knew their dad, their mom, and I've known this family a long time. It's a good family. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Psalm, chapter 23, with me tonight, please. 23rd Psalm. Now, the 23rd Psalm, uh, I learned at uh, Beaumont Grammar School. Wasn't that awful, public school system? Terrible. Teaching kids from the Bible, scriptures. But uh, I never had to worry about getting shot to death. Never one time. All the way through high school. Never happened. Psalm chapter 23 and verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over, surely. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, have you ever read anything more beautiful than that? It says a psalm of David. This is 3,000 years old. It sure beats the talk on the street, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Father, bless this holy book. In thy name I pray, amen. I was reading some letters yesterday written by Roman soldiers encamped at Hadrian's Wall. How many of you know Hadrian's Wall? Some of you, I'm sure, know that. It's a wall that was built in northern England to keep out the Picts, P-I-C-T-S. This is where you get the word picture. Their body was covered with, uh, with the tattoos, and they were, they were, the, they were so, so uh, vicious uh, fighters that one would intentionally fling his body down upon the spear or the sword so that his buddies could climb across his back and get you. And so this is what the Romans, uh, they were imperialists, you know, they were colonizers. They went out, the Roman Empire, they were empire builders. And the Brits, these people were the forerunners too, the Brits did not like it because they were in their land. So in order to keep this northern tribes out away from his soldiers, they built a wall. It's called Hadrian's Wall. That wall's still there. That wall's nearly 2,000 years old. It's quite a thing when you think about it. But those soldiers would write letters back to their wives and to their family, and they've got those letters, got a lot of them. It's quite remarkable reading. They talk about how lonely it is up there being so far away, and, and uh, they talk about how that they barter to buy this and barter to buy that, and, and they miss this one and miss that one. And I got the distinct feeling as I read the letters from these Roman soldiers 2,000 years ago, they weren't a bit different from us. Amen. I've been in the military, and we had mail call. How many of you have been in the military? Then you know what mail call is. It's a big deal in the military, big deal. The guy would get a letter from his sweetheart, and he'd stand up in front of everybody, and he'd smell that letter, you see, that the girlfriend would put... Uh, uh, you know, perfume or something on it, and oh, it's a big deal. Mail call was a big deal, and if you went to mail call and they didn't call your name, you didn't get anything. You left away. You left from there sorrowful. You don't understand what it's like to be away from your loved ones and your friends, and left you've been away from your loved ones and your friends, and uh, that's the kind of thing you learn by experience. You can't get it out of a book. You have to learn it firsthand. So the 22nd and the 23rd and the 24th Psalm are called the Shepherd Psalms. If you'll remember when our brother was with us the other day, he preached from the song Psalms of Degrees. You remember that? The Degrees. Well, the Degrees had to do with the approach to God. They sang and they worshiped as they went up the hill to the approach to God. I've photographed, I've been to the Holy Land five, six times, and every time I go, I make, a, I make it a special point to go look at the mikvahs. A mikvah is a 
It's a, it's a man-made like a pool where water can be kept and they can be cleansed. They can be baptized in the mikvah. This is part of the cleansing process as they approach the top of that mountain. The steps are still there that are 2,000 years old that led to the top of the mount, of the temple mount. And you'll find one step that is this wide and the next step is this wide. And the reason it's like that is because you have to stop and think. Your mind, if you've ever noticed, when you go down a flight of stairs, I've been told this before and it's true, your mind has already calculated how far it is to that next step. And if that step is not where it should be, you're going to come tumbling down. It's just not unless you're really looking at what you're doing. Well, these steps that lead up to the Temple Mount, one is this wide, the next one is this wide. In plainer words, contemplate, think, see law, study, look at what you're doing. You're approaching the Mount of God. You're coming into the presence of the Holy One of Israel. And as you approach that mountain, you'll hear 5,000 voices singing, hallelujah, the glory of God at the top of that mountain. Singing was a great part of the worship of the ancient Israelite. They sang, folks, they sang. The Psalms are songs that are to be sung. And the 22nd and the 23rd and the 24th Psalms are called the shepherd Psalms. And I'm sure you've heard that before. But to the 23rd Psalm has to do with the chief shepherd. The 22nd Psalm has to do with the good shepherd. And the 24th Psalm has to do with the great shepherd. Each one of these are unique and separate from the other, but they all belong to the same shepherd. If there's anything to be true, it is that our Lord Jesus Christ is the shepherd. And I believe that he, and that he, he owns that title and he owns it in his heart and in his soul. Because if you'll remember now, he laid his life down so that he would become the good shepherd. The good shepherd is contrasted with a hireling. The hireling is the one who flees from the flock. He's not, he won't stand and fight. You see, David talked about how that he would pull a little lamb out of the mouth of the lion. Literally, pull it out of its mouth. He would talk about how that he would find the pieces of a little lamb or a sheep or some animal like that out in the field where it had been attacked by one of the predators and he didn't get to it in time. And all he could find was just pieces of what had been there. It bothered him. You see, in order to be a king, you need to be a shepherd. In order to be a warrior, you need to understand the nature of the battle. And David learned these things, and he learned them early in life. When, uh, when Jesse marched all of his sons in front of Samuel, the prophet of God, Samuel saw the strong sapling of a man, and he said to himself, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But God said, No, nah, Samuel, God does not look on the outward appearance. He looks upon the heart. And it's all about the heart, our relationship with the Lord. Have you any left, Samuel said to Jesse. Yeah, I've got my son, my youngest. He's out with the sheep. We'll call him. And when he called him in, God said, that's the one. And so David became the king of Israel, rising head and shoulders above any and every king they ever had. None ever matched the reign of David who reigned for 40 years and united the tribes of Israel, all acknowledged that that one man was their king. There was no other David. And then God said of David, I will give the sure mercies of David, and I will perpetuate the house of David. His throne shall forever, ever, ever, and ever be upon this earth, and there will be one sitting on the throne of David. It will never cease to exist. And when our Lord Jesus Christ comes, and when he comes, and he will come, he came the first time, he will come again. He will sit down on the throne of his father David and he'll reign there upon this earth. Make no mistake about it. When God says he's gonna do something, he will do what he says he will do. So David's the king and David's the shepherd. And he's, David was the good shepherd in every sense of the word because he went out and he fought the enemy. He met the bear, he met the lion on the battlefield. He offered up his life in defense of his sheep. He was willing to die for them. So therefore, being willing to do what he should have done and what he was supposed to do, David's the good shepherd. He's also the chief shepherd because there were those who rose up underneath David who never could rise to the level of David because David was truly a shepherd at heart. He loved the Lord. When he wrote the 23rd Psalm, 
We learned, as I said in school, when I went to, you know, public school system, we learned the 23rds. Oh, the, almighty God, let something like that come back again. Don't you think that would be good? Ah, oh, quit listening to these stinking devils. It would be good that our kids could learn prayer and read the Bible in their public school system. Amen. You say, what about all the other gods? There's only one God. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But it's not going to happen in this country. But the Bible teaches us very clearly that David, David was the good shepherd, then he was the chief shepherd. And then David will come back, my dear friend, and he'll come back in his son, the Lord Jesus, as the great shepherd to reign over his people. So he dies for the sheep. In the 22nd Psalm, we read some things that are very disturbing. If you look in verse number one, Psalm 22, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? While the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross at Calvary quoted verbatim this scripture. It's obvious that he was fulfilling what the 22nd Psalm had to say. Look at verses six and seven. But I'm a worm and no man, reproach of men, despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head. It's amazing, my dear friend, at what he went through, how he, what, what he endured at the hands of men. Then in verse number eight, note it says, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. They mocked him and made fun of him. But that didn't end at that. Look at verse 16. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You had the physical battle that you could see, but there was a, spittle, a spiritual battle raging Upon that cross, the bulls of Bashan were coming against him. These dogs were coming against him. Satan was throwing everything that he had against our Lord Jesus Christ. But don't you look at verse number 30, because there's always a good thing involved when God does something. He completes it and finishes it. Note carefully, Psalm 22, verse 30, a seed shall serve him. Amen. My, the seed that he's talking about in the book of Galatians, our brother will get to that. Uh, when he, as he continues to teach through the book of Galatians and Abraham, the seed, the seed of the Savior. In Genesis chapter number three and verse number 15, he said, he shall, he shall, he shall destroy that serpent's head. He shall wipe him. He shall break him down. And he will. Our Lord Jesus Christ is going to come. And Satan knows that. And so the good shepherd laid his life down. That's qualified him to be our shepherd. Then in Psalm chapter number 23, we find the, she, the chief shepherd. Look at verse number one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And note carefully in verse two. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Is the Bible an enigma to you? Is it just a bunch of old things and you can't make any sense of it? I don't know how many people have said to me, preacher, or they've said in some other form or fashion, we just can't understand the Bible. It's so hard to understand. Let me say something for you tonight that'll be such, I think would be a great help to you. Read that part you can understand. Yes, yes, read that part you can. And if any man lack wisdom, let him what? Ask of God. Don't expect to go into the Bible, open up a book that it took my dear friend 2,000 years to write. Don't expect to open up a book like that and just master it all of a sudden. And the truth of the matter is most of your Bible scholars and all, well, you know, they're okay. But the best thing to be in the Bible is not a scholar, it's to be a student. It's to continue to learn. Amen. A student of the scriptures. Learn, study. Folks, I've been reading the Bible a long time. And I open up the word of God and God amazes me. The things begin to show me from scriptures that I've read a hundred times. Yet he begins to open it up to me. And I, I say to myself, truly, this book is alive. <laughs> No question about that whatsoever. You see, the Bible says in verse number three, he restoreth my soul. Now, this is the work of the chief shepherd. If you get over here, and I'll read the scriptures for you, you'll find it over here in the book of uh, 1 Peter chapter number five and verse one. Look what it says about the chief shepherd. The elders which are among you I exhort, whom also an elder. Now, who said this? He said he was an elder. Who was it? Who wrote the book of, who wrote the <laughs> first Peter? <laughs> Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Somebody tell me. Yeah. <laughs> Who wrote 1 Peter? Of course, the apostle Peter, Simon Peter. All right, now look what he said. He said, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. So what is this? An elder is an ordained minister of the gospel of Christ, 
and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And note carefully now, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. There is therefore a connection of the chief shepherd with his bishops and his elders. And that's what he's talking about. That I give a direct account to him as my chief shepherd. He's over me. He rules over me. And this is what he's talking about in the 23rd Psalm. This is the chief shepherd. If he can't feed me, how can I feed you? If I can't walk in fellowship with the Lord, how in the world am I going to teach you what fellowship is? So what is the point of a bishop or an elder if God doesn't have a reason for them being here? Of course he does. He has his bishops and he has his elders. And so we read over here in the 23rd Psalm in verse number four, three rather, he said, he restoreth my soul. Amen. And he can and he will. Verse number four says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for thou art with me. And that's enough just to know he's with you to know he's standing by your side. Amen. I don't know what he's going to do, but that's not what's important. God doesn't have to tell me everything he does. It's amazing, folks, at all the stuff the Lord does and doesn't say a word to me about it. Amen. How about you? Amen. <laughs> I mean, they're building stuff all around here. Buildings are going up. Roads get this. Bridge gets that. And my phone hadn't rung one time. <laughs> you mean to tell me, preacher, you're not that important. Exactly. He's important and not me. He's the one that matters. He knows, and that's good enough for me. So the Bible says in verse number four, he's with me in that valley of death. But look at verse number five. Thou preparest a table before him in the presence of mine enemies. Why in the world would he put a table in front of your enemies? Because he wants your enemies to know that he's with you. He's going to bless you, and he's going to feed you, and he's going to take care of you. And your enemies may gnash at the teeth, but that's okay. As long as you have one that is feeding you, and taking care of you, you can live through that and with that. And so the Bible says in verse number five, he uh, anointeth his head with oil and his cup runneth over. There's a provision, a provision. And the anointing is the greatest provision that he can give to a bishop or an elder. Called of God to minister the word of God, ordained of God, called of God and anointed. The anointing is so important. The Baptists bless their heart. Uh, just don't seem to give much credence to that, just like they don't really have a whole lot to say about the Holy Ghost. It's such a shame, and I love them. I'm a Baptist, been a Baptist a long time, so that gives, I, I, I suppose I can be a little critical of them. They need to know more about the Holy Spirit. They need to know about the power of the Holy Ghost. They need to know how he can come upon your soul and move your life, how he can change you. The power of the Holy Spirit of God was shown in Acts chapter number two when he came down as a rushing mighty wind and that wind blew down upon them and they came alive. The power of the Holy Spirit is found in the gospel of John when he appeared to them and breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Oh yeah, he can't do, he said, without me you can do nothing. And everything Christ did, he did here by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Who are we to think that we can do it any other way? My goodness, what arrogance on our part to think you're going to do the work of God without the Holy Ghost. We've got to have the Holy Spirit of God. That's the anointing. And then finally we end it there in verse number six. He says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Dwell in that house forever. Yes, we will. We'll, uh, we'll. You know something, folks? <clears throat> Eternity without God, I don't care if you, I don't, it make a difference where you are. You don't have to be in hell. Eternity without God would be pure misery. Imagine an existence without God. Imagine that for eternity. And let me tell you again that while I'm at it, because it's, a, it's one of the pet peeves of mine, try to wrap your mind around eternity tonight. I mean, look at this. I'm, I'm just 77. I've been here a little while. I'm a vapor that showed up, and now I'm passing off the scene, and it moves so quickly. We're here today, and we're gone tomorrow. Why, eternity, folks, is not a thousand lifetimes. It's not a million lifetimes. It's not a quadrillion lifetimes. 
There is no comparison of a human lifetime to eternity. Eternity is beyond our grasp. We really can't take hold of what it means. And the decisions you make and the things that you do as it relates to God have eternal consequences. That's important. That's very important. Eternal consequences. Then we have the 34th Psalm, which is the Psalm of the Chief Shepherd. And it's a beautiful thing. Notice the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th Psalm. Do you suppose David, when he wrote these, had any idea of how they would be connected with each other? I don't know. We don't necessarily didn't have to know it. But remember, 3,000 years ago, these people lived exactly the same, with the same fears and problems and shortcomings, failures, and all of that that we do, folks. The same thing. Nothing has changed. Just like I started out talking about those Roman soldiers that were encamped next to Hadrian's Wall. Nothing's changed. Fact is, I've read some of the ancient Egyptian texts. They've even got that. You can go back. It's amazing. It's the old stuff you can find. And you'll find that the ancient Egyptians essentially wrote the same way as the ancient Romans. They talked about life and they talked about their problems and they talked about stuff that we talk about today. Same thing. What's the difference? We got light bulbs and we've got cars and we've got jet engines and we've got telephones and computers. Apart from that, we're just the same as they were. Nothing's really changed. Look at the 24th Psalm. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein. Well, in Psalm 22, he's dying. There's no question. I mean, if you've studied any, you'll find probably 99.9% .9 of all of the Bible commentators will agree that the 22nd Psalm is a crucifixion Psalm. It's the, it's the sacrifice of our Savior. And the 23rd Psalm they'll fit in is with the chief shepherd. And then the 24th Psalm, we get into victory. You see, the 23rd Psalm has to do how he has to do with how he relates to his people, especially his bishops and his elders, because they have to receive of the Lord. But the 24th Psalm has to do with his glory and his power and the future and who he is and why he is what he is. The Bible says in the 24th Psalm, look at verses three and four, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Well, now, if you lived, as I said a moment ago, 3,000 years ago, you'd be asking the same question. You can't, by your own righteousness, ascend into the presence of God. You can't do it. You can't do it. Don't try it. <laughs> don't dare. Don't you dare. I don't care how good a life you think you've lived. Do not dare to approach into the presence of a holy, almighty God by your righteousness. There's got to be one bigger than us, more righteous than us, one that is perfect and pure. And that's who Christ is because it is his righteousness that allows us to approach God. But you see, it was the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that allowed him to ascend to the top of the hill or the mountain of God. You see that mountain that's over there in Jerusalem right now with a temple on it is simply a type of that mountain in the sides of the north, that mountain in the third heaven, that mountain where the presence of God abides. There is where he eventually ascended, our Lord Jesus did, by his own righteousness into the presence of God. And I'm sure the archangels and the angels and the seraphim and the cherubim and all the rest of them as they saw him come up said one to another in antiphony. One said this, the other answered them and said, who is this? What's he doing? He's trying to approach. He's coming by us and he's going to be coming into the presence of Almighty God. What's going on here? And he goes by them, and they watch him as he goes by, and then they realize, this is that one that was born in Bethlehem of Judea, that little baby in that manger that lived that sinless, perfect life. And God has done something here that, that, that men could never have seen beforehand, and now he approaches into the presence of God. And God the Father smelled a sweet savor. Smelling in the Bible is a big deal. The Bible talks about in the Old Testament of the stench of the decaying flesh and the stench of religion. But it talks about the sweet smelling savor of that one who is committed unto the Lord God and given to him. And our Lord Jesus Christ was a sweet smelling savor.
The Bible said, thou shalt see the travail of his soul and shalt be satisfied. The implication is God smelled a sweet savor when Christ gave himself completely, physically, spiritually. In every sense, my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ gave everything he could give. There was nothing held back. Every part of his essence was given to the Father as a sacrifice for us. And the Father smelled a sweet savor. And when his son approached him and came to his side, the Father said to my Lord, the Lord said unto my Lord, as the, son, the Lord said unto my Lord, God said to God, you getting hold of this? God spoke to his son, O oh God, sit down, you're finished, the work is done, and it is done, folks, don't try to add to it. The Lord spoke unto my Lord, can you imagine that almighty absolute eternal being calling anything else God well you see he has to because the Lord Jesus Christ is as much God as he is there is that Godhead and that's the mystery that has yet to be fully revealed because we fully don't understand it and this is why it says in the book of Revelation the mystery of God is revealed it's then we begin to take hold the great things that God has in store for those that love him this is the great shepherd, the great shepherd. I want you to notice that in verse number five of Psalm 24, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Amen. Now, what do you mean salvation? He raised him from the dead. That's the salvation. And when he raised him from the dead by raising Christ from the dead, he put his mark upon him and said, this is my son. When he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the angels sang praises and said, Unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. When he was baptized in the Jordan River, the heavens opened, and God said, This is my son. This is my son. At the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, God spoke again and said, This is my son. This is my son. Amen. And then, my dear friend, when he raised him from the dead, he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Who declared that? <laughs> Who do you think said that? This is my son. Amen. If I can use the word tonight, and I don't know how to use it really in the right context, but he's proud of his son. <laughs> Amen. Yes, he is. He's fully satisfied with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you please the son, you've pleased the father. If you've received the Son, you've received the Father. If you've blessed the Son, you've blessed the Father. If you believe in the Son, you've believed in the Father. If the Son is your Savior, so is the Father. If you love the Son, you love the Father. They're inseparable, one and the other. There is no distinction to be made. He's God. If you've seen me, he said to them, you've seen the Father. Say, well, I mean, was the Father, did the Father have a body of flesh? The Godhead had a body of flesh. And the body of flesh was the God-man that walked among us 2,000 years ago. Notice carefully, this is, this is beautiful. Verse number five. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is when he pours forth the power of the Holy Spirit of God. As the great shepherd, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, will be poured out upon all flesh. He says that in the book of Joel. The Spirit of God's going to be poured out upon all flesh. You've got a taste of it in Acts 2. But that wasn't the fulfillment of it. The day is coming when the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out, and he's going to be poured out by the power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say this. Everything the Holy Spirit does now, he does it by the power and the authority and the direction of the Son of God. And the Son of God has, it does everything that he does all the ability he has, all the authority he has, has been given to him by the Father because he arose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father and was received as the sacrifice of all mankind. There is none to please the Father but the Son. You believe in the Son, you've pleased the Father. Look at verse 7, Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. 
He is the king of glory, Selah. Look at all these Jehovistic combinations. Now I want you to count the capital L-O-R-Ds with me. How many have a Bible with printer's type? Do you see the capital L-O-R-D? Look at verse 1. The earth is what? All right, that's the tetragrammaton. Now I don't want to get technical, but please listen to me. This is important. This is yod Hey vau Hey, yod Hey wai Hey. however they put it out in English letters to transliterate what is in Hebrew, okay? These are consonants. How do you pronounce them? You remember what I said to you this morning. The Masoretes were a group of Jews who lived by the Sea of Galilee or Lake Tiberias. They, li they lived there and the Masoretes were the ones who were responsible for keeping what's called the Masora. How many ever heard of the Masora? Oh, you've heard about it. Anyone, anytime, have you ever heard a preacher telling you that they counted every word, every letter, and the location of that on the paper as the scribes copied it? All right, well, you are t you're hearing someone talking about the Masora. The Masora is called by Ethelbert Bullinger. You ought to get his book, The Companion Bible. Here's what he says. He says it is the fence to the scriptures. What's a fence? It is built for protection. The whole idea is that the Masoretes were responsible to see to it that God's word was copied verbatim. They missed nothing from copy to copy to copy. All right. So here's what they did. They took the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. And every time that those four Hebrew consonants showed up, they added the vowel points that they created themselves. And they took the word Adonai. And they took the vowel points from the word Adonai and they put them to these four consonants. And it came away by being pronounced Jehovah. Now let me be just candid with you tonight, okay? I don't have any, any bones to pick and I'm not going to lie to you. Listen carefully what I'm saying. I'm not going to lie to you. When people come along today and jump up in front of you and try to, and try to intimidate you and say, His name is Yahweh, listen to what I'm saying. Neither Jehovah or Yahweh can be proven one way or the other. Okay? Never heard that before. Well, I'm telling you, I want to be honest with you. Why? Because the ancient text did not have a pronunciation for those four letters. And we are completely and totally dependent upon the Masoretes for us to say Jehovah. And for them to come along and say Yahweh, and that's their right and their privilege, they want to do that, that's fine. But don't ever let them tell you that they have authority for that over Jehovah. Neither one of us know for absolutely certain how those four consonants were pronounced. And here's something else I've thought of many times. They may never have been pronounced. They may have been in that text from the time Moses wrote it until the time the Masoretes put their vowel points to it and it was never pronounced. It's called the ineffable name of God. All right? Now, it's going to be important when I get to the latter part of my message tonight. So we're dependent, aren't we? I told you the truth. I told you that I cannot prove without a doubt that Jehovah is the, act, is the, is the correct pronunciation of these four letters. And you certainly cannot prove that Yahweh is the pronunciation for these four letters. Can you understand that and receive that? Okay, now check me out if you want to. That's fine. <laughs> no problem. But there is a name we do know how to pronounce. <laughs> he made sure we did. Notice how many times Lord shows up in Psalm 24. Verse 1, one time. Verse 3, second time. Verse 5, third time. Verse 8, fourth time. Verse, uh, I've missed one. Verse eight, one, one time. Two times. There you go. That got me. That's what it was. Two times. And then verse number, and verse number uh, 10, one time, which makes how many times does it show up in Psalm 24? Somebody got it. Six. Six times. And six is the number of who? Man. What they're telling you is that the man Christ Jesus is the Lord of hosts. The man, they're emphasizing his manhood. And folks, that is exactly how he ascended to the right hand of the Father. 
by his manhood. <laughs> it was the man. Now, you need to get right with God tonight. The Bible says there is one mediator. One mediator between God and men. What's a mediator? He's one that can sit down between two opposing parties. And he can mediate their communication, connection with each other. That's what a mediator does. So there is one God and one mediator between men. Christ the Lord. What's it say? Did you hear that preacher on the front row? I'm sure he's preached that many times. The man, Christ Jesus. That's your mediator. Oh, he is Christ Jesus, certainly. But it's his manhood. The man, Christ Jesus, is the mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. So we have the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th Psalm. I've been candid with you. I've told you the truth. I've told you that there is no way you can prove either one, Jehovah or Yahweh. No way. But now here's an interesting statement in Philippians 2, verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Who? Jesus. Is there any doubt in the way that name's pronounced? No. He has his Old Testament counterpart, Yahshua or Yahashua, and it literally means Jehovah saves. Or some folks would say, well, Yahweh saves. You see, it is God saves in the name of Jesus. Now, why is that name important? Well, you remember what he called himself over and over and over and over again while he was here. He said, the son of man, the son of man, the son of man, the son of man. His humility, his condescension, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The man, Christ Jesus. So the name Jesus is the name of the God-man, the son of man, the one who earned everything he has now. Nothing was given to him. By his own essence, he could have called worlds into existence, but he never did. Everything he did was in, a, in complete obedience to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, God hath given him a name. Wait a minute. Isn't that what the angel said to call him when he was born? Thou shalt call his name what? They told him? Yes, they did. But you see, this is the thing you learn about the Lord. He calls those things that be as if they were not. In plain words, he can prophesy about something before it ever happens, and it's going to happen exactly the way he says it's going to happen. And so when he called his name Jesus, there's no doubt in the mind of Almighty God, he will save his people from their sins. So what name is it when you get to glory? What name is it when you begin to shout and sing and glorify God? Will it be Yahweh and Jehovah and up there a dog fight over how that's pronounced? Or will it be Jesus? You better believe it'll be Jesus. It'll be that name that stirs your soul. You see, there's no argument about, argument about that name. In Greek text, it's Jesus, Jesus. The gematria of that word is 888. In other words, the numerical value of that word is 888. The number eight in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. Seven perfection, 888, new beginnings. Christ is new beginning, new beginning, new beginning. And listen, folks, by their tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of millions, they will be shouting and glorifying the name of Jesus. I want to hear that name. Amen. I want to hear the name of Jesus when all of these voices at one moment in total syncopation say the name of Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Have you said that here? I hope you have. Because I have, I have, Jesus, there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved, and the name Jesus. Father, bless your word in the time we have together tonight. Bless it as it goes forth. I hope I've been helpful. I hope, if nothing else, I've caused some folks who aren't too sure about anything to take what little I've said to them tonight and let it be the springboard for them to do a little research into the, some of the things that I've said and see if they can see what I'm talking about. And Father, if there be one in the house tonight who do not know 
the name Jesus as their Savior, then, Lord, I pray that it be so. I pray it be so. I pray, it, I pray they'd understand it. They'd understand the name of Jesus. Because there are those out there, Lord, who call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses and Jehovah's Worshippers that do not know the name of Jesus. They do not know it. They have no clue. But in thy name I pray. Amen. What have we got, brother? Thanks, brother.